Julia, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to come here uh, again after a couple of years, I guess. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about um, quenches in classical isolated problems. And um, oops, sorry, something wrong about the presentation. Okay. Uh, so to be more precise. Uh, what I'm going to tell you about is the dynamics of isolated disorder classical models and I'm going to try to discuss with you uh, what kind of evolution in time they have, whether they reach equilibration in some sense, which sense, and uh, talk a little bit about generalized Gibbs ensembles and fluctuation dissipation affected temperatures in this context. So uh, the questions that people have been asking in uh, recent years concern mostly what happens with the quench of a quantum isolated problem. And uh, the ideas uh, for looking uh, at these kind of problems were boosted by interest in uh, cold atom systems, so experimental advances that allowed to create and uh, more or less control the behavior of uh, systems of many atoms in interaction between them, but not with the external world. So the problems are supposed to be uh, quite uh, isolated from any environment. And then questions about what is the role of the internal interactions concerning equilibrations uh, of these kind of problems were posed. In particular, comparisons between what are considered to be integrable versus non-integrable systems uh, arise in the context of these quantum problems. And I will come back to uh, this issue a little bit later in my talk. There was also motivation coming from the field of many body localization. I'm not going to talk about this, but uh, for example, Marco is interested, and Julio also, in this kind of uh, problematics. Uh, these are novel effects of uh, quench random interactions or potentials on the behavior of many body quantum systems uh, in interaction. But uh, somehow, the, the same kind of questions can be posed in the context of classical isolated systems. And in a sense, uh, these questions concern the old ergodicity question uh, that has been posed at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, if you wish, uh, studied by physicists at the beginning, but mostly by mathematicians later on, and physicists somehow, uh, we forgot about uh, discussing this ergodicity problem, which is indeed very difficult to attack and to uh, study uh, with analytical tools. So what I'm going to tell you today about are two recent papers that I worked on with uh, my colleagues in Argentina, so Gustavo Lozano, an old friend of mine, and, and Nicolas Nessi, his postdoc there, and then uh, Marco Pico and Alessandro Tartaglia from the lab joined in a later publication. And uh, part of the last part of what I'm going to tell you about, the relation between the effective temperatures in GGEs and the effective temperatures of fluctuation dissipation theorem, uh, started in uh, Santa Barbara, the, were <laughs> the Santa Barbara we were together, uh, attending together, Marco. And um, it started with discussions uh, with uh, Robert Koenig. And uh, we have a couple of works uh, with uh, Laura Foini, Andrea Gambassi, uh, Jacopo Denardis, and Milos Panfilo on this field. So let me try to start defining a little bit more precisely what I was saying with words. So what are quantum quenches? So the idea of a quantum quench is that you take an isolated quantum system with a given Hamiltonian, say H0, that you initialize your system in a state, for example, a ground state of this H0, but it could be a mixed state. It could be some uh, situation characterized by a density operator, a uh, hat row of uh, the initial time T0, let's say, and then evolve from T0 onwards with a different Hamiltonian. So a different evolution operator constructed with a different Hamiltonian from the one that you use to build the ground state or build the um, initial density matrix. So H hat is different from H hat naught. And then you ask questions such as, does the system reach a steady state at some long time? Uh, if it does, whether this steady state is described by some thermal equilibrium density matrix, for example, of the kind e to the minus beta, some parameter to be determined, H hat, H hat being the uh, post quench Hamiltonian here, or do at least some observables behave as once determined by this kind of uh, um, density operator, 
does the evolution occur as in equilibrium? Do you know correlation functions as a function of time, evolving time as they good in equilibrium with this kind of density matrix and so on and so forth. Then if none of these questions is answered uh, by a yes, then you can ask, uh, well, if nothing happens as in equilibrium, how does it happen? Can other kinds of density matrix be used to describe the, the behavior of the problem? But then you can ask similar questions in the classical context. So you can say, let me take an isolated classical system with Hamiltonian H node, and basically the only difference with what I said before is that there are no hats here, and evolve it with H. Now I have to choose the initial condition for uh, the system I'm working with, and I could say, well, let me take a set of configurations characterized by the space, uh, phase space uh, variables, positions, and momenta, say for a particle system to make it easy, and this initial state psi nodes could be drawn from a probability distribution of this kind, for example, with the initial temperature beta nodes, the initial Hamiltonian H nodes. So this would be like the equivalent of the uh, density matrix, density operator that I uh, wrote in gray in the previous transparency. And then you can ask the same questions. So does the system reach a steady state? Uh, is it described by a thermal equilibrium probability density of this kind with a new H and some new beta? Uh, or do at least some observables do, or if not, what happens, and so on and so forth. So the questions are the same. The setting is a little bit different. Now, I must say that there has been a lot of work on these kind of issues, especially people who uh, treat one-dimensional systems that can be solved analytically have done immense uh, you know, advances in the understanding of uh, the answers to these questions. But there hasn't been uh, the equivalent on this uh, side of the story, you know, what happens with classical problems um, prepared and uh, evolved under this kind of uh, uh, protocol. Okay, so don't hesitate to stop me and ask questions. Is the uh, setting clear, what I'm saying? Okay. okay, so now let me just summarize a little bit the kind of quenches I'm going to talk about or consider. So I'm going to consider quenches in which the change in the Hamiltonian concerns the change in the potential energy. I could have changed the kinetic energy, but I'm going to change the potential energy. Now, basically, there are like four building blocks of what a potential can do. And my uh, sketches here are applied to one-dimensional systems to make the drawings simple. So say that this is the position in one dimensions of a particle. The drawing here are the potentials that does the, the particle field. And for example, what I can do is start from a potential that has a single minimum, say at the position zero to make it easy, and then change it to another one which has a different um, spring constant, a different harmonic uh, uh, parameter, uh, but it still has only one minimum at the same position. This is one kind of change I can do. And say that initially the particle was sitting at this position x x naught here and say that it was feeling this potential and that this instantaneous change from the solid line to the dashed line the particle is feeling this other potential so i have injected potential energy into the system by doing this quench this sudden change in the potential going from the solid to the dashed if i did the inverse i would be extracting now I can have a little bit more complex situations in which, for example, I go from the dashed uh, situation with a single minimum to one with a kind of symmetry breaking sort of form with two minima at the um, symmetric positions with respect to the origin, say. Uh, or I can have uh, situations in which I have a double well kind of potential and I change it. Or I can go from a single well to a flat situation or from a flat situation from a single well. But this cases here, uh, one can quite rapidly convince uh, ourselves that, you know, they're kind of the main things that can happen. Uh? So, you know, the interpretation of what's going to happen in my results of more complex systems later on, I will be able to think about them, sort of <coughs> thinking about these kind of changes uh, in the potential um, energies of the problem. So basically the summary here is that by doing these changes in the potential, I inject or I extract energy into the sample, and then the dynamics will have to accommodate to the new uh, situation. Say, for example, if I start here in the dash potential at this position here, uh, before I could do motion you know, that go 
that went from this end to the other one at constant energy, while here, once I'm in this second well, I can only move over there, right? So these kind of things have to be uh, considered in the interpretation of what I'm going to, to get later on. Okay, so which are the models I'm going to consider? Models I'm going to consider are going to be models that we know very well in the field of glassy physics that can feel or can seem to be a little bit bizarre from the point of view of other branches of physics, although they are now also appearing in string theory and in, in variations. But anyhow, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider problems where there are um, either many spins in interaction or a particle feeling a very complex potential energy landscape. Uh, I will show you the mapping, how it goes from one to the other one in a second. In the field of glassy physics, these are called P-spin spherical disorder models, and I'm going to consider the isolated uh, version. They are interesting problems because we know a lot about them. Uh, we know a lot about their equilibrium phases in usual situations, a canonical equilibrium. We know them uh, in full detail. Uh, we also know how they relax when they are coupled to uh, an environment. And now the question I will ask is how do they evolve when they are not coupled to an environment, when they are isolated from any kind of environment. So these are the models uh, that I'm going to consider in more detail. So here is the, the definition. So the definition I'm going to give in terms of the potential. So this potential here uh, has terms where if I think in terms of spins, these are classical spins. <coughs> Moreover, there are spins which are not easing spins of the kind that you are used to, but they are going to be real variables, each of them. But they are globally constrained by a spherical constraint. Okay, so I'm going to draw a sketch in the, on the blackboard. So say that this space here is the space where I put in each of the axes, uh, in each of the axes, I put one of the uh, spins. With all of them, I can build a vector. And the global constraint over all the spins tells me that this vector is forced to move on the sphere with radius the square root of n. So the spin can rotate on this uh, sphere, but it cannot get out of the sphere, neither outside nor inside. So this is uh, what uh, defines the variables. And now I have a potential, which is a weird, weird kind of potential, but a potential in which I have pair interactions between two spins. And I can have also groups of three spin interactions mediated by these exchanges here. And I will choose these exchanges, these and these, to be taken from a probability distribution, and I will give you some details about these probability distributions later. Uh, so you see that once I have put my spin in terms of uh, a position, <coughs> I mean, in terms of a vector, I can think of this vector as a position, a position of a particle, let's say, and this particle is confined to move on the uh, sphere in n dimensions. And uh, it feels a random potential, V of S, which is defined in this way. And it's random because of these random exchanges here, which are fixed variables taken from our probability distribution, so quench randomness in the jargon. Okay? So since this uh, potential is uh, strange and it has a lot of randomness in it, uh, the drawing that I was doing with minima and you know barriers and so on here, I have to think about it as uh, like a mountain uh, landscape on top of this sphere. Mm -hmm. So it's something like this. This is a sketch that I just stole from some, the internet, uh, where there are wells, there are barriers. There should also be some flat regions, like plateaus on the mountains. And you have to think about this uh, potential wrapped on uh, the sphere over there. Okay. No, this is a sketch. I mean, this is for taken from some, <laughs> I don't know, from another problem. I took it from, uh, I don't know, the talk of somebody else, and I don't remember who's this somebody else. So, okay, 
so there is a kinetic energy that I'm going to add to this potential energy, and I'm going to use just you know normal kinetic energy, so momenta squared over twice m. I'm introducing a mass. The mass of the particle in the interpretation of the particle problem is just the mass of the particle. And uh, the, um, the uh, total Hamiltonian is the sum of the two terms. Now, the evolution of the problem is given by just Newton Hamilton equations of this kind. And in this notation here, I haven't added the constraint that forces the particle to be on the sphere. But I have to think that in this potential energy here, I just forgot to write it in this. Uh, slide, uh, there is also going to be a term that forces the particle not to leave the sphere. So this, this is the original potential I showed before, plus another term with a Lagrange multiplier that forces the particle to be on the sphere. Now, I told you that uh, one knows a lot about how these potential energy landscapes are, really, how many uh, minima barriers and how they are organized. Uh, for these problems from calculations done over the past, I don't know, 30 years by many people. Uh, the important features that I want to underline here that are going to be useful for me later on is that there is a huge difference between the problem that has only two component interactions and the model that has three or more component interactions. So the first problem is known to have only n and being the number of components of the spin vector or the dimension of the space in which I'm moving. Uh, so in the case with two body interactions only, there are only n saddles, including minima and maxima, saddles of any kind, but only n. While in the other case, they are exponential in n saddles. And this is known in, in this you know, potential energy landscape. Another difference is that uh, the barriers between those uh, saddles, or minima, or maxima, or whatever they are, they scale differently in the case with uh, only two body interactions and in the case with uh, more than two body interactions. So they're much higher. Actually, they scale with the system size, with the, the number of dimensions, in the case with three, and they don't in the case with uh, two. So the, this topology, if you wish, of the, uh, yes? Here, it's a, well, it, no, it's n. In this case, it's n. This can be seen from basically from numerics because it's difficult to compute the uh, height of the barriers uh, analytically, but uh, it's proportional to n. It is due to the mean field character, and it's also due to the fact that it's very interacting this problem. So somehow it's. Uh, yeah. In other problems, like, uh, well, as you know, I can tell you. So in this SK model, for example, uh, it, this is supposed to be a power of n, but smaller than 1. So, so subleading energy barrier densities, if you divide by n, uh, go to 0 for the SK, but not for this one. So for this one, it's, it's n. So it's, uh, there are different ways in which one can uh, argue for this without necessarily well, like, uh, we can discuss it later, but it, it's... Uh. Okay, so now the, um, the guess, I mean, I wrote clearly here, but okay, it's not that there is a proof, but it's quite feasible that to imagine that the case with uh, P is the number of uh, variables that you have in the, um, in the interaction. So the notation that we use usually or the name, if you wish. That we use in the jargon is that uh, if I have here a number of factors that interact, uh, the two cases that I showed before were p equals 2 with only 2 body and p equals 3 with uh, 3 body. Mm -hmm. So this is the jargon. So p equals to 3 or larger, we expect it to be in the non-integrable family of problems in the sense that, uh, well, you cannot guess that there are going to be as many constants of motion as there are variables in the system. Basically, what I'm saying is that the interactions are so complicated that I'm not expected to be able to solve it by quadratures or uh, things like this that are typical of integrable systems. And the guess is, uh, is that for non-integrable problems, 
again from ergodicity arguments, non-integrable systems are supposed to reach, in the long time run, uh, a Gibbs-Boltzmann-like equilibrium at some effective temperature or inverse effective temperature beta f uh, that the system should choose itself from its interactions and from its dynamics. This is what is expected in the uh, p equals 3 case. While in the p equals 2 case, as I will show you later, this is a bit like announcing the, the, the results that will uh, appear in the next uh, slides, the p equals 2 problem turns out to be an integrable system. And actually, quite surprisingly, turns out to be a problem that in the context of integrable systems, in a slightly different setting, but OK, after a mapping, which is very simple to do, it's a model has, that has been introduced uh, in 1850 <laughs> by somebody called Neumann uh, in the context of classical mechanics, and it's an integrable problem. And in the context of classical mechanics, uh, of course, this problem was studied for n equals 3, 4, you know, and that's it. I mean, small numbers. And I will be interested in the limit of n going to infinity. Mm -hmm. So my interest will be to talk about n going to infinity and to ask questions about equilibration for long times, but having said it going to infinity first in my, in my setting. Yes. So the P equal to 2, your potential is quadratic. It is. So the force is linear. Yes. So it's not a big one to that zero. No, but you have the spherical constraint. Okay. You have the spherical constraint. So uh, it, it's not only harmonic oscillators. It's not independent harmonic oscillators. It's coupled harmonic oscillators via the constraint. The yeah. And however, uh, you can deal with that, or Neumann dealt with that uh, long ago, and it turns out to be integrable anyhow. Sorry? Yes? Why did you say uh, almost coupled the harmonic oscillators? I thought it was, I mean, I didn't see the, uh, in the absence of J, wasn't yeah. it three particles, or? Uh, okay, so say, take the case P equals 2. So P equals 2, what Kidong is saying is that the potential part is just this. So it's quadratic in the variables. So after some diagonalization that I will show you later, this you can uh, transform into oscillators uh, that are independent. However, there is an extra term that I'm not writing yet, but I will write later. Uh, that I'm going to call Z. So there will be an extra term in my potential with a Lagrange multiplier here that imposes the spherical constraint. It's still quadratic. It is still quadratic. Yeah. But the Z, well, you will see it depends on the S's itself. So it's not completely quadratic. But OK, it's simple enough that it can be dealt with and solved. Yeah, let's ask. Yeah. Here, yes, but it doesn't matter. You can, well, what I'm saying is that I'm setting i i equal to zero. So here is different from j. If you wish, I can put it yes. this way. And the normalization of the j i j's uh, is done with n in such a way that everything is extensive. I mean, all terms scale in the same way with n. There is no problem with that. Yeah, no, I was saying just that when n goes to infinity, it's true that it's almost a uh, harmonic oscillator, but the, uh, when n is finite, as you say, z is a function of the s. So exactly. It's really the fact that it's integrable for n equal to 4. It's not obvious, exactly. So, yeah. But it is. And actually, Uhlenbeck, I don't know if I wrote it. Yes, I wrote it in this slide. Uh, Karen Uhlenbeck in 82, now 1982. Uh, she uh, worked out the uh, constants of motion for this problem, but I will come back to this uh, later. So there, there are formulae, expressions, for the constants of motion, the end constants of motion of, of this problem. Okay, so let me go ahead a little bit with the analysis of the problem. So I said that I had to choose initial conditions. So which kind of initial conditions I'm going to choose? I'm going to exploit the fact that I know the phase diagram of the problem in equilibrium, in uh, canonical equilibrium. I know that this problem has a phase transition, both for p equals 3 or p equals 2. In both cases, there is a t over j, j being the typical strength uh, here, uh, with a phase transition at some critical temperature, let me call it tc where the behavior changes from paramagnetic-like or disorder-like to something that knows about the potential, something that is determined by the form of the potential. So 
I'm going to choose initial conditions in equilibrium, and I'm going to tune the temperature that I put in this initial uh, Boltzmann weight uh, to be either here or there. Uh, OK, so let me jump over here. It's a bit too detailed. So now what is the quench that I'm going to do? The quench that I'm going to do, it, I'm going to do it on the uh, coupling strengths. So let me say a little bit more about the coupling strengths. I have already said that they were random. More precisely, I take them from a Gaussian probability distribution with zero min and variance given by an expression with a scale. So this is the scale that appeared here. And normalized by n in such a way that the limit of n going to infinity makes all them here scale in the same way. So this can be extensive, be proportional to n. So with this strange factor n to the p minus 1 in the um, denominator, I ensure I know it's known forever that this is good done this way. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change all the uh, coupling strengths in the same way. So I'm going to scale them, basically. Uh, the reason why I do that is because with the quench, I don't want to change completely my potential energy landscape. I want to keep some memory of the one that I had before the quench in the dynamics that I get after the quench to make the problem more interesting. If I change it completely, if I reshuffle completely the strengths, it would be too simple and uh, not very interesting. So this is the case which makes uh, life a little bit more uh, intriguing and, and, and for which I have uh, interesting things. So basically, uh, the control parameter of the quench is the ratio between the energy scale of the post-quench interactions and the energy scale of the pre-quench interactions. And with the control temperature here of the initial conditions, I choose whether I am in an initial condition which is disordered or which knows a lot about the uh, potential energy landscape that I had before and that I will have after the quench. So again, with a quench, what I'm doing is uh, I'm changing the form of the potential uh, in the way I was uh, showing you before with the sketches. And I can also think about it, uh, for example, when I keep a lot of complexity in the potential, I'm uh, sort of uh, reducing the barriers, uh, moving the uh, minima and uh, maxima above or below, and uh, you know, it's kind of a rescaling. Now, how do we solve these problems? So there are a number of techniques that uh, are, again, quite standard to solve these kind of problems. One is to derive, and I don't want to go into the details, but just to give you a flavor of how it looks like, to derive differential equations for the correlation function and linear response function of the problem. So let me draw, write the definitions here. So the correlation function is SIT, SITW, the response function is delta SIT, delta HITW, H equals zero. And these averages here are over initial conditions and over the disorder as well. So over different realizations of these uh, interactions. So let me write it this way. Uh, I don't know, J disorder, let's say. OK, so the, the interactions are averaged over and the initial conditions as well. So there are techniques that can be used to derive sets of coupled differential integral equations for these correlations and linear responses uh, in the limit of n going to infinity. So this holds for n going to infinity. And z is the Lagrange multiplier that imposes this spherical constraint. It depends on, tem on time. Uh, there is an equation for z that one can write as well that um, writes z in terms of uh, the correlation and the response themselves. I didn't write them in this uh, slide, but there is only also one. And importantly enough, if I want to impose initial conditions in equilibrium at an initial temperature beta prime, the technique to do it involves the use of the replica trick. And uh, basically what this amounts to is that there are extra terms appearing in these equations that correspond to the correlation between the evolution time and the initial time. Mm? This is the time right after the quench. Uh, this is the time after a, time, a reference time that I'm calling here TW. It doesn't matter so much. 
But correlations with the initial times appear, appear here, there, and a little bit everywhere in the, in the expressions. So this is the way to, to write, uh, I mean, this is, these are the equations that one has to solve. The D and the sigma are known as well, so they are written in terms of C and response uh, themselves. So these are a set of closed integral differential equations, and the Lagrange multiplier is fixed by the condition that the correlation function sum over I uh, has to be one at equal times. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is uh, the condition that fixes Z. Now this set is solvable numerically and it's also solvable analytically in the long time run, at long times, under some assumptions. I will not go into these, but again, <coughs> these are techniques that are well known in the, in the community and uh, we know how to, how to apply them. Sorry, but in, the, yes. in the long time, uh, this third uh, equation that you have for the initial condition kind of decay away, decouple no, away? No, it depends. Okay. It depends. So in certain cases, uh, these quantities will go to zero and then you can drop them. In other cases, no. Okay. The system will keep a memory of the initial okay. condition, even asymptotically. Okay. And then these will go to some constant, but that you have to determine. Right. The equations uh, determine it. Okay. Yeah. Equilibrium. You you remain in I equilibrium. Exactly. So you start at beta prime in equilibrium at beta prime. Uh, this let me call it prime here. This is the one that controls the initial state. And then you you can well, verify from the equations that you know all the properties of equilibrium remain with oscillations, of course, because you have a second time derivative in the equations, but uh, you know, it's not the kind of equilibrium we're used to. There are still dynamics, but uh, it's so equilibrium dynamics. No uh, the potential is here, so there's no assumption. Uh, no, there is no exactly. So this is for any potential. Uh, then the form of the sigma and the d will be determined by the potential, right? So these forms uh, hold both for p equals two and p equals three. Okay, so now let me show you the result first for the p equals 3 case. So for the p equals 3 case, we summarize the results in a phase diagram. The vertical axis is the quantity that uh, controls the initial conditions. So above this TD that I'm drawing here, uh, my system is initially in a paramagnetic state, doesn't know anything about the potential, let's say. While below this TD here, the system is confined, this I know, but I'm not going to explain it so much here, but I know from the knowledge of this problem that I have uh, a potential energy landscape that roughly, uh, what I see is something you know, very complex, something like that, and that at T primes, which are below this dashed line here, what I'm doing is that I'm starting from equilibrium in one of these. Hmm? So equilibrium T prime uh, smaller than T. Now, in the horizontal axis, what I tune is uh, the quench. And what I'm doing here, on the left of one is energy injection, on the right of one is energy extraction. So, uh, how do I know this? Well, I know it from the uh, solution to the equations I have just uh, shown you. And uh, let's, for example, look at what happens if I do a quench here. So I start from a paramagnetic initial state and I inject energy to make it even more paramagnetic. So in this kind of picture, it's like I was seeing a potential like this, paramagnetic, center at zero, and I'm changing it uh, you know, to something else, but it's still center at zero. So PM, PM. So, this is the, uh, do I have it here? <laughs> Maybe I didn't took this example. Uh, no, actually the case I did, well, okay. The case I took as an example is one in which I start from here. Sorry for that. So one of these uh, equilibrium states uh, before TD, below TD initially. And I go to a paramagnetic state after the quench. So it's um, actually in my phase diagram. 
is saying that I start here and I go up there. So I'm sorry, I start, no, I start here and I go here. This is what I'm doing. So I'm starting from one of these confined states of equilibrium uh, initially, and I inject a lot of energy, and I go to the paramagnetic situation. So how do I know that? Well, I know that because if I look, for example, uh, at how the correlation functions behave after the quench, I see that they oscillate, and they go to zero. So the system loses all information about the initial state after some time, and it decorrelates completely from it. So the zero here is giving me information about the fact that I'm going to a paramagnetic state that you know, decorrelates from itself very easily. Whether it equilibrates to a Gibbs-Boltzmann equilibrium measure after this time, I can check, for example, from looking at whether the response and the correlation are related by equilibrium fluctuation dissipation theorem. So without giving all the details, equilibrium fluctuation dissipation theorem tells that chi and c, integrated linear response and correlation function, should be a linear relation with a prefactor that should be 1 over the temperature. So the fact that they are in linear relation, I see it, because the gray line here goes on a straight line. From it, I can read the temperature that the system reaches after the quench. So I get a number, and then I can, for example, compare with the asymptotic value of the kinetic energy and the asymptotic value of the potential energy that I get after the quench. And these are the lines which are there. So after the quench, after some time, these two quantities reach constants. For example, the one above is the kinetic energy. And then I can check that the kinetic energy satisfies equipartition at this temperature, Tf. Or I can check that the potential energy reaches a value which is the one of a paramagnetic state at this Tf, which is this other value over there. Another way to say what I have just said <coughs> is that in the paramagnetic state, there is a relation between the energy, the total energy, and the temperature, which one can prove is given by this expression. And then I can check that the total energy, which is this line, uh, is given by you know, this relation with respect to Tf. So everything is consistent. So in this case, uh, when I take a system out of a metastable state with high barriers between it, and I take it to a paramagnet, the system manages to equilibrate after some time in this new paramagnetic situation. And this is for p equals 3. Then I can do something similar where I initialize the system here, and I change the potential, but I don't change it so much to you know, take it to a, si a situation which is paramagnetic. So what I say here is that uh, an image that I, uh, I should have said this, an image that I found useful to explain what I'm doing uh, is that imagine that you have, I don't know, a, a, a plane that is flying within a valley in a, a mountain uh, landscape, right? So while the plane is within the borders of this valley, whether I inject energy on the plane and I make it you know, be a little bit higher in total energy, but not so much so that I don't get it out of these uh, barriers, it will remain there. It will move differently than when it was like here, but it won't get out. The case I did before is that saying that, OK, I gave it so much energy that it went above all the reach and uh, you know, could uh, move without any constraints. Now I'm going to make this example. How do I know that I remain confined? By looking at the correlation functions, either with the initial condition, which is red, the red curve here, or with uh, different times. So doing these kind of calculations for two different times and looking at how the correlations behave as a function of time delay. So I see that in both cases, the asymptotic values of these correlations are non-zero. They are different, but they are definitely non-zero, you know, like 0.65 or something like that. So these are the questions that Marco was asking before. So the red one would be the C of T0, but it's non-zero, so yeah, in the analysis of the equations I have to check. Now I can check this fluctuation dissipation relation. I see that it holds again with a value Tf that I read from here. I check the values of the asymptotic potentials and Q 
kinetic energies. And I notice that they are also fixed by the values that I expect to have in one of these confined states. So in this case, again, I'm following metastable states. I'm not getting out of it uh, during the quench. And I reach equilibrium in the new configuration or in the new situation with a beta f that is also fixed by the total energy through a more complicated expression than before, but there is an expression that I can derive and everything is consistent. So again, I get equilibrium in this case. Sorry, what yes. is, uh, can you say, well, Q naught and Q are two different values, values and because there are different limits. Uh, exactly, because in one case, I'm taking the initial condition before the quench, uh, and I'm doing the correlation between the configuration that I have at time t after the quench, and the one that I had right after the quench, but is the one that I reached before. So this is the Q naught is the limit of t going to infinity of this object here with the averages and the sums. While q is the limit of t minus tw going to infinity of the limit of tw going to infinity of set setw. So this is, both of them are long after the quench. So this one accommodated to the new potential and I'm seeing how I decorrelate from the new potential. But this one was the one from before the potential, so it changes. Okay, so uh, there is another case which is interesting uh, with I in the phase diagram I called aging here. I'm not going to discuss it because I don't have time to go to the P equals 2 case either, I, uh, otherwise. Uh, this has to do with glassiness in this problem. Uh, you know, if you're interested, we can discuss it later, but it's not interesting for my purposes here. So, conclusion of what I said, T equals 3 behaved as uh, we expected. Uh, so it reaches Gibbs-Boltzmann equilibrium in most cases, apart from the glassiness. It's non-integrable. Everything behaves as, as it should. But now what happens with the P equals 2, that from the point of view of glassiness is the less interesting case, but I claim here that it's the more interesting case from this point of view here. This model is integrable. The constants of motion were known. They are complicated functions of uh, the position and the momenta that I write later, I think, otherwise I can tell you. Uh, but for integrable problems, even in the quantum uh, literature, one doesn't expect the system to reach equilibrium after one of these quenches. Because in a sense, there are not enough interactions within the problem to be able to you know, let the system act to, uh, as a bath on itself and equilibrate. So what happens? In the quantum literature, people have claimed that something that is called a generalized Gibbs ensemble may describe the long time behavior of at least certain observables. And this measure in the classical uh, language is a generalization of the Gibbs Boltzmann one, where basically you include as many inverse temperatures as constants of motion you have. And what you have to put in the exponential is the product of these inverse temperatures times the constant of motion. So imagine that you have only one constant of motion, that is energy. Then you have e to the minus beta h, which is what you have for Boltzmann. Now, in these cases where you have n constants of motion, people have proposed that you have to generalize these weights to be e to the minus beta mu, sum over mu, times i mu, the constants of motion. So does something like this uh, apply in these sort of problems as well? Or can one construct it? You know, you can ask all these sort of questions. Now, how does one solve this problem? Now for p equals 2. So some of you have already noticed that for p equals 2, the problem is quadratic. So you can diagonalize it by going to the basis of eigenvectors of the matrix of interactions. Um, what did I say here? Uh, okay, before going to that, I wrote something else. So what I wrote here is that one can prove that this problem, as I said already, has n saddles, and these saddles are the eigenvectors of the JIJ matrix. This can be proven. The absolute minimum is the alignment of the spin S, the vector, on the eigenvector Vn, the one that is at the limit, at the edge of the distribution uh, with eigenvalue lambda n associated to this eigenvector Vn. So what I'm saying is that 
if I have this picture here, and now I think about this um, uh, coordinate space as being given by the eigenvectors of the eigen of the uh, interaction matrix Jij. Now each direction is an eigenvector. Uh, there is the direction, this one here, that is the absolute minimum of uh, the V of S. Uh, there is uh, the um, something else that one knows is that in the large n limit, the eigenvalues of this matrix Jij are distributed according to a semicircle law. And uh, the last one is here. So this is the lambda n eigenvalue that corresponds to this Vn over there. Mm -hmm. So this is the absolute minimum. And then the saddles are organized in such a way that the next one is minimum in n minus 1 directions and flats in the, re in the, re in the remanent one, and so on and so forth, until this one is the maximum. Okay, and this is the minimum. So there is something special concerning the directions of the eigenvectors of this matrix. I will show you later how to diagonalize the uh, dynamics of the problem. Uh, something else that is known about this problem is the constants of motion, as I said. Uh, and the constants of motion look like this. So mu is an index that I'm now using to identify the different directions of the eigenvectors of the interaction matrix. So S mu is the projection of the vector S on the direction V mu. So S mu is S scalar V mu. In my notation, P mu is P scalar V mu. And it turns out to be that this expression, horrible expression here, with this, the eigenvalues of the lambda, of the j's, uh, are constants of motion. OK, this is uh, worked out here. So uh, the constants of motion are known. Now, what happens? Now, the dynamics can be solved by going to the basis of eigenvectors of the interaction matrix, as I said. So Newton's equation look like this. Now they are linear, apart from the Lagrange multiplier. And the methods to solve are two, either the schindler dyson equations that I have already shown, or another method developed by Soridiadis and, and Cardi for the quantum OL problem that can be translated into this problem very simply, and that allows to solve these equations for finite n. Mm? So there's a technique, there's, it's not very complicated. Uh, at the end, one has to do some numerics, but one can solve this set of equations for finite n uh, exact, I mean, exactly up to numerical accuracy. So you can kind of for yes. Yes, exactly. So you write a self-consistence equation for Z, and there is an intelligent way to solve it. Yeah. So what happens with the phase diagram? The phase diagram looks similar to the one I showed you before, uh, in the sense that there is a region that I can call paramagnetic, a region that I can call confined, a region which is a little bit like the aging one before, but uh, not exactly the same. Um, they are distinguished by what do the correlation functions do asymptotically, whether they go to zero or they go to a different from zero value. They are also distinguished by what does the integra integrated response uh, do in the long time run. They take different values. So with these two limiting values, one can distinguish these three zones. But now let me ask the question about equilibration. What happens with the equilibration? So in this case, for example, what I'm doing is the equivalent of the first example I gave you before. So I start from a confined state. I inject energy. And I want to know whether in this kind of paramagnetic new situation the system equilibrates. And the answer is no. So I can look at correlation functions. I don't see much. I see oscillations uh, more around 0, more or less. I can look at correlation functions here. I see oscillations, probably stationary oscillations as well. From these two plots, I cannot tell much. But from this plot here, when I check this supposedly linear relation between the integrated response and correlation, I see that it doesn't work at all. So I get this curved 
thing uh, that it's very far away from what a straight line would be. And here is just a fit of the straight line to the slope it had uh, here, the curves had here, but it definitely they deviate. So there is no single temperature that characterizes the relation between the susceptibility and the correlation. And this, in a sense, is fine, because I said this problem is integrable, so I didn't have to expect any equilibration like gibbs boltzmann for this case. So in any sort of quench, I shouldn't expect it. it now I'm looking at this one. It doesn't hold. Fine, OK. Now the next question to ask is, uh, what does it happen? You know, do I have an effective description of the dynamics in this region after these quenches that goes beyond gibbs boltzmann equilibrium? So something I can do is to look at the evolution of the Lagrange multiplier, because basically the only source of deviation from just harmonic oscillators is in the Lagrange multiplier. So if I look at the behavior of the Lagrange multiplier, I notice that it oscillates at the beginning, but then it approaches a constant. And this I can even prove analytically. Here is just numerical solution of the equations. But I can see analytically that for this quench I'm looking at, z of t goes to a constant that is given in terms of the initial condition and the post quench uh, strength by this formula here. Anyway, a constant. Now, if it went to a constant, now my Newton equations are decoupled and are the equations of independent harmonic oscillators, which are the modes S mu uh, that are constructed by you know, projecting on the directions of the eigenvectors of the matrix. So now I have independent harmonic oscillators, and for each of them, total energy is conserved when these arrive to a constant. So from their own kinetic and potential energy, I can extract a mode temperature, for example. And what I'm showing you in this plot below is the spectrum of mode temperatures that I get for this kind of quench. So the modes are not do not all have the same temperature. This is, again, telling me that the system is out of equilibrium a la Boltzmann. But I have one temperature per each mode. I can also check that each mode satisfies an FDT relation with respect to its own temperature, T mu. So asymptotically, I see that uh, I have mode temperatures, and I have constants of motion, these epsilon mu. So in principle, I could construct asymptotically a GGE with these T mu and these mu in the exponential of my weight. But these mu are not equal to the I mu of Ullenbeck. They are something else. These mu are simple expressions. They are quadratic already uh, as functions of S mu and, and P mu. Uh, and uh, they are definitely different from the I mu of Ullenbeck, which are constants of motion from the beginning, from instant zero. Now the question is, is there a relation between the ensemble of these and the ensemble of those? There should be, but I cannot tell you the answer because I don't know which one it is. Okay, so up, up to there is where more or less we arrive with the analysis. There should be a way to, um, I don't know, do linear combinations or do some kind of combinations, not necessarily linear, linear, definitely not linear, of these to build those. These are quartic in the variables. These are quadratic in the variables. So I don't know which is the relation between the two, but there should be. Another issue that uh, one can do is to try to see whether this mode temperature uh, can be measured in some other way. Uh, not just by you know, identifying the modes and measuring for each of them their own internal energy and so on and so forth. And this has to do with the um, work that we did with uh, Robert Koenig, Andrea, and, and, and Laura Foini uh, one year ago, uh, which is the fact that we realized that for the quantum isolated problems, uh, the effective temperatures of the generalized Gibbs ensemble can be accessed, all of them, in one measurement, if one computes the fluctuation dissipation ratio between the response in time, Fourier transform to frequency of your system, and the correlation, again, Fourier transformed, this ratio here in equilibrium should give you beta. Out of equilibrium, it will give you some function of the frequency. Now, it turns out that from this 
functional form of the frequency that you get from here, it coincides with the beta mu's inverse temperatures of the modes. If you make a connection between the omega of the measurement and the omega mu's of the uh, of the modes. And this can be done exactly for oscillators. I mean, it's very easy to see how this works for oscillators. Think of a single oscillator. A single oscillator responds to a single frequency, its own internal frequency. So a single oscillator will have uh, a response at its own omega mu. And hence, this object here will give you some temperature only for omega equals omega mu. So for each of the oscillators, you pick its own temperature. And uh, by sweeping over all <coughs> the oscillators, uh, or sweeping over the frequencies here, you sweep over all the oscillators. Basically, this is the way it works. So what I'm showing here with red and black are uh, we read the mode temperatures of this quench. This is another quench. And uh, with black, this construction for the same quench. And you see that, uh, OK, they, they coincide uh, rather well. The oscillations in black is just because we are solving the um, trigger keldish equation numerically. And of course, we have a finite uh, time interval over which we can solve those equations. And then when we go to Fourier transform, there are oscillations, which are spurious oscillations there, uh, that should disappear for sufficiently long time intervals. But OK, this is beyond the numerical capabilities we have. The uh, orange line is just some analytical, very rough approximation. Uh, don't pay a lot of attention to, to that one. Uh, this is another example where the uh, approximation works better. This is another example of another quench. OK, I think time is uh, more or less over. Uh, so here I summarize what we have for the B equals 2 problem. Uh, so definitely, the system is not able to act as a bath on itself, and it doesn't equilibrate to something like this for any of the quenches that we have done. Now, does it approach a Gibbs Boltzmann, sorry, a generalized Gibbs ensemble of this kind? I don't know yet. <laughs> I don't know yet, because these exist. This should exist as well. There should be a way to define them or compute them, but I don't know how to do it. Uh, now, what I definitely know how to do is to you know, see that asymptotically the problem decouples into harmonic oscillators, and I know the epsilon mu's, and I know the beta mu's. But I don't know the relation between those. Uh, this is just to show you that we did some numerical, very preliminary analysis. So these are uh, spectra of uh, uh, the um, mode temperatures in blue. Uh, and the, what is it here? It's the, um, yeah, the constants of motion of Ullenbeck in red. Uh, so in certain cases, you see here, for example, they seem to go uh, more or less to the same situation. This is for some kind of quench. I don't know which one. don't remember which one. Uh, but in other cases, they are definitely different. But this doesn't mean that some combination of the red dots will not end up being the blue ones. So I don't know. OK, conclusions. So we studied the quench dynamics of uh, classical isolated disorder models. Uh, we showed that for non-integrable cases, they can equilibrate to Gibbs Boltzmann measures. Uh, but they can also undergo non-stationary aging dynamics. I didn't talk about this, but uh, you know, if you're interested, I can show you how this is uh, appearing in the B equals 3 case. Or most probably, uh, in the uh, integrable cases, most probably they approach a GGE, although I cannot give you a definite answer about that. And whether this, this, or this happens depends on the type of model and depends also on the kind of quench performed. And what are we doing now? We're, we're trying to understand a little bit better this issue of the constants of motion in the P equals 2 model. And uh, we're working on extensions of these studies to the quantum realizations of these same kind of problems and uh, understanding better the approach to the GGE uh, Definitely. That's a very interesting issue, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Bye-bye. <coughs> Good. You showed for the correct case a very strange diagram response correlation. Uh, yes. Where there were all the oscillations. This one? Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
you know, it just means that this representation is not telling you anything about the relation between fluctuations and dissipations in this case. Because uh, here, you know, the response I'm plotting here is the global one, where I sum over all the spins, the correlation as well, and the system is so madly out of equilibrium that this relation doesn't, is not a relevant uh, way of uh, looking at the problem, let's say. It seems that for one correlation, you have several response. Yeah, but it's, it's madly out of equilibrium. So the, uh, you know, the fluctuation dissipation relation, the linear relation that you should have uh, in a gibbs boltzmann situation is definitely super violated. So it's just com confirming the fact that this quench doesn't take to gibbs boltzmann equilibrium. Next you can say, well, what can I do? What should I do better to characterize responses and correlations? And then you can think in terms of the modes and realize that each mode is responding differently and that you can compare mode to mode but not different modes. Yeah. So once you go beyond uh, gibbs boltzmann equilibrium, chi against C doesn't need to be uh, related in any particular way. So uh, with respect to this last uh, result, so you have uh, an effective temporal from GG. Yes. That is different from the effective temporal that you get let's say from fluctuation dissipation during the long time limit of yes. the equation. Uh, this is a statement about uh, finite m or both, because in, in, or large m. In some sense, the Dyson equation, you solve it in the larger limit. I the guess. Dyson equation, I solve it in n going to infinity because so I only write also them. the reason of the mismatch, right? Because the GG instead uh, is a claim, is a statement about any n. The, the so GG is any n. So, so the, only, the only thing I can tell you for the moment is that this works. And this I can even prove analytically. Okay. Once yes. I go to the asymptotic limit in time that my modes are decoupled and that they are, uh, you know, oscillators. Yes. So when they become independent oscillators, I know that the ratio uh, between inverse, in, in between response and correlation made in this way will give me the beta mu of the modes. And this is the same that you get from GG? GG if I construct ah. it with the energy of the modes. Yes. But not the GGE that I would construct with the Uhlenbeck's constants. Okay. This one I don't even know how to build it, to tell you the truth. Because this one I should build with E minus beta mu GGE, I mu yes. over there. The problem is that this one, as functions of S and P, are quartic. So oh, okay. analytically, I don't know how I to do calculations. See, I see. And then I can do some numerics, okay, but no I, I haven't done it yet. So you see, as you know, uh, what I should do to fix this is to say, yeah. uh, do some averaging, yeah. no? Yeah. Averaging of the i mu's well, here. Not it's not quadratic, so analytically I cannot do it. Okay. Okay. Uh, but I could do it numerically, but okay, you haven't done it yet. Yes, yes. sorry. I had a very kind of question, maybe something I don't understand. So at the beginning, you said if n is equal to 2, you have n set of points. P is equal to 2. P, P is equal to 2. Is equal to two so yes, yes. You have n set of points. Right. This I can more or less understand. And if P is bigger than 3, you have an exponential number. Yes. So this is something I can you give a kind of simple argument. Because it seemed to me that you have a cubic potential. Yes. And then you are trying to find settles. Yes. So you're solving algebraic equations. Uh, square equation equal to zero. I mean, yes. so you get an exponential number of solutions of a set of polynomial equations? Uh, I'm certainly missing something, but I just don't understand. Uh, or if you have another argument. Well, if you do the calculation, you get it. Now, uh, I mean, I have a set of algebraic equations. Yes. So polynomials of degree two mm -hmm. equal to zero, equal to zero, equal to zero. Yeah. How can you get an exponentially large number of. Uh, do you have an argument by just hand waving to explain why? Is no, hand waving I don't. Uh, to two and well, to three? Uh, maybe to make a, a small map on all, all these questions. If the equations were uncoupled, you would choose a branch for each of them. So you have an explanation number of choices. Oh, okay, just yeah. choosing the branch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. yeah. Then yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's yeah. not uncoupled. Yes, 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 it's even worse. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a choice of the yeah. branch. Um, and I had another question. In the large time limit, this E mu becomes constant of motion. 
These are constants from the very beginning. I sorry, the EMU. Ah, the EMU, yes, exactly. But not at finite time. No, no, because at finite time they are coupled via the Lagrange multiplier, so they are not, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not constant. No, yeah, at the beginning is not. Yeah. It's, uh, it's doing, for example, in, in this case, it's doing this. Uh, there are other cases where it oscillates a little bit more, but you know, eventually it will reach a constant. The expression of the constant depends on the kind of quench, but in all cases we've seen it does reach a constant. So which when n goes infinity. Is there yeah? a question for this GGD, which I don't really know yeah. anything about? The constant of motion are not unique. I mean, it's just they have to be evolution. Right, exactly. But they're just not unique. Yes. So the beta mu's are not unique. I mean, I could choose i mu plus i prime mu prime. Uh, absolutely. And i mu square plus right. i mu prime to the power 36. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, this is true. So yeah. my temperature will change. So, so what what's people the point in talking about temperatures? I mean, choosing one set You choose a set so of uh, a representation of your constants of motion yeah, in evolution. Change. I can change coordinates completely. I agree, but okay, you and could say, so I mean, in the Boltzmann case, you could use h squared, h, or h to the 25. Yeah, but yeah, in Boltzmann case, I have a kind of good, yeah, energy <laughs> kind of Yes, I know. I mean, it's not exponential minus beta e squared, it's exponential minus beta e. Right. Right. As a constant, yeah. I think you, yeah. I mean, if I'm in this case, I don't know, but yeah. in the case of the study, there's one additional criterion, which is the observable Yeah. The average, I mean, in many cases, the first moment is local, but if you take the square, you will be an observable, which is ugly, not local, and so you would never be able to observe it. So okay. if you were able to observe it, you would see that GG is not working, but I would be put this as question, okay. but actually you observe it. If you say from the beginning that you allow yourself to observe only local mm -hmm. observable, then it seems somehow that this uh, arbitrariness is so good. Yeah, yeah. Used I, I think it's there, but you don't see it. So yeah. It's yeah, I think it's not completely settled, no, this issue no, of the yeah. locality yeah. because yeah. it's a new thing, relatively new thing that appears. And here, they are local, both of them. Or no, they are completely non-local here because you know my problem is totally non-local since all the spins are coupled to all of them. Uh, so it's you know by definition it's a non-local problem. So the th I don't know the issue of the locality for the uh, GGE. I mean, if I want to construct. I have the impression that for this problem, this GGE should work. There should be a GGE like this that, that should work without any issues of localities. But uh, the first thing that I should do to convince uh, myself and other ones is to find this, this relation. Uh, but okay. Yes. Yeah, so the question is Ah, in, the, in this particular case, yeah. uh, I no, no, I mean, the, the, when the, the integrable people who are interested in small n, of course, uh, they solve the problem uh, yeah. by quadratures. So you know the actions and you can write the Hamiltonian in terms of actions. Yes, 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 yes. And then you can linearize about the steady state. Like yeah, that. yeah, this they do, but they do it for a small n. Okay. Uh, they do it for, for a small values of n. Uh, so. But my I'm interested in n going to infinity because you know if there's going to be some issue of equilibration beyond the locality, there should be an n going to infinity taken somewhere because otherwise you're not going to be able to equilibrate to talk in terms of equilibration. So for me, it's essential to take n going to infinity. Uh, then of course, to do the numerical uh, investigations, I take uh, I also take n finite, but I have to be very careful about you know uh, taking n to infinity. Asymptotically, somehow. I mean, uh, before. Yeah, for any end, right? Sorry? It's integrable for any end. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you again. Thank you.